So hello and welcome. Happy Friday to everyone. The weekend is already here. Can you believe it? Today is Friday, July the 10th, and this is question and answer episode number 68. And this is the way to be. So the things that we're going to discuss today were based on questions that are submitted by people just like you through the past week. And I print them out. And we have quite a pile to get through. We're in a heat wave here, so it was a question whether or not I would even get out here in this observation hive building. You get to see the progress a little bit. I've used this for the background the last couple of weeks, so maybe things are changing week by week and you get to watch. So lots going on in the apiary. We did another video that's in editing right now that will come out later, and that is honey harvesting in super hot temperatures. I also walked around and did thermal imaging of all the hives, their entrances, landing boards, hive visors, and things like that. So this whole series is designed for backyard beekeepers. This is small scale beekeeping where you might be able to put more time than commercial beekeepers have into each individual hive because you'll be more acquainted with them, you have fewer. And uh, I keep an apiary here in northwestern Pennsylvania in the United States, North America. And uh, we're in a heat wave. It's in the 90s. It's going to be in the 90s again today. We also have not had a lot of rain. So it's amazing to me that the bees are still bringing in their resources. Now, how do you get to put in your question? You can write a question down in the comment section below this video. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, go down in the video description below and you'll be able to see each subject in order that we cover it today. And uh, you can submit your questions there. There's also a link. You can go to my website, fill out a form and submit your question that way. I can't answer everyone's questions. So what I do, as I try to select questions that I think are pertinent to the time, what's going on right now, and also relevant to the basics of backyard beekeeping. So very sophisticated, involved questions, you know, about things uh, that are what I would consider advanced won't be discussed here. So we're going to get right into it. And the first one comes from Mark Dennis, Hicksville, Ohio. So I was wondering if during winter, of course, this is, we're in summer right now. But this is a winter question. Uh, I want to move the hive with the winter bees in the hive to a different location on my farm. Will the bees head to their old location in spring or will they reorient themselves to a new location depending on the winter? They may be cooped up for two or four months here in northern Ohio. I can't say exactly how long because some winters are mild and uh, some are wild. Thank you for your opinion. My opinion is you can move bees almost any time, but here's the thing. We know that the foragers, the scouts, the bees that leave the hive uh, return to a very specific location. They orient to that location and they're always going to come back. So if you pick up your beehive and you move it six feet or a hundred feet off to another side of your apiary, what you're going to find is that the foragers and bees that are acquainted with being outside are going to come right back to the spot where your hive was. So that's a problem. So what often people will do is bees have memories. They register the area. They take notice of geographic locations. They communicate that with little waggle dances like are going on down here to the other bees so they can find their way out into the world and then back to their hive. They're very specific about that location. Now the cool thing is I actually recommend that people shift things around in winter time because when the ground's frozen and the bees are all inside their hive, and this only works, of course, in the northern parts or wherever winters get really cold and the bees cluster. So once the bees cluster and enter into that state of torpor, which is almost like hibernation, but not quite, it's borderline hibernation, 
then uh, you can pick up your hives and move them anywhere during that time. Because what's, what's occupying the hive primarily then are the winter bees. They do live for several months, which is different from the foragers we have out right now. We're in a nectar flow, which is pretty funny, being that we're in July. And uh, we have a lot of foragers going out, but they're burning themselves out. These foragers are lasting three or four weeks, and then they're done. They're dead. So in the winter time, the winter bees live for several months, and their job is to take care of the brood. So in the fall, when those winter bees are being produced inside your colony, they're not foraging, they're not flying out or doing anything. What they're doing is conserving their energy and developing fat body stores so they can get through winter. So now it's a great time to move just a couple feet. If you want to reorganize your entire apiary, I would say that winter time is exactly the time to do it. The few bees that are flying out to do cleansing flights, which is bees that are inside the hive during winter, do not eliminate inside the hive and soil it. They hold it and they wait for a warm day, usually in the 50s or when the sun hits the landing board and warms things up nice, they fly out, they do their business and they get right back in the hive. Their whole, their whole motivation is not to pollute the inside of the hive. So most of your bees are in. Then when the spring comes and your hive's in a new location, they do their orientation flights and I think you're good to go. So winter to me is the preferred time to move bees. And if you're gonna do that, now somebody else will say, well, what if I wanna move them now? What if I wanna put them in another location? Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a friend who has property several miles away, remember that the foragers in your bee colony will forage several miles, depending on how far they have to go to get the resources that they need. So that means they've already oriented themselves to coming back to where your hive specifically is located. If you move a hive in your apiary just four feet over, the bees seem to have great difficulty locating that. Now, if it's the only hive, if you only have two colonies of bees, let's say, then there's a very good chance they're gonna find their way back because they're going to follow the pheromone of the hive, the colony that they've come from. So if it's a few feet over, they'll eventually find their way there. The problem comes in when someone has many hives and they line them all up and they look the same and uh, they're not unique in the landscape. So it's always beneficial to put your hive underneath a tree next to a, a very conspicuous landmark that the bees see from a distance. And then when they get in close, now they're navigating by pheromone. And there's also something called bee drift. And that is when honeybees coming back with resources, nectar and pollen, and uh, they land on the wrong landing board. They get stopped and inspected by a guard bee right there. But guess what? If they're full of resources, they get invited in. So you just lost the bees from one colony into another. So bee drift will be a problem too if they're having difficulty orienting themselves and finding their specific hive. So the closer you put them, the more similar they appear, the more likely you are to have bee drift and the more difficult time the bees will have in orienting themselves and getting back to their colony if it's been moved at all. Sometimes even when you shift a landing board, if you shift an entrance, if you put it to one side, you put an entrance reducer in, they are so tuned in to their routine that they fly to the landing board and they go right to the spot where the entrance was, that inch and a half wide entrance if it's moved over here, just 10 inches away, they go to the spot where it was and they seem frustrated for a while and then they eventually go in. But it's amazing how even something as minute as moving the entrance or closing one entrance, opening another one on the same hive, you'll find out that they're frustrated because they're very tuned to going to one specific area to get into that hive. So there's a lot going on. If you have someone that's a long way off and you wanna move your hives in summer, close them up, move them several miles, leave them there for a week and let them forage and orient. And then at night, because you wanna recover as many of those foragers as you can, and you're gonna lose some. Because during the summertime in particular, uh, bees navigate by daylight, they navigate by the sun. So when it gets dark, they can't see well, so they just sit on a plant underneath a leaf, uh, on a flower, and they spend the night and the following morning when they warm back up, they fly to where their hive was. And if it's not there, now they're in a pickle. So anytime you move your hives, you risk losing bees. But uh, then leave them in your new location, several miles away, 
for a week or two, bring them back, put them back in, the, in your apiary where you want them to be, and then you'll get them back. But that process will always result in some level of lost bees. But uh, that's it. Next one, Nate, Wels Nate Wilson. Quick question about swarming. I have a hive, had a hive swarm. I caught them and got them in a 10 frame box with no drawn cone. Some new beekeepers don't know what the terms are when we say drawn cone. And uh, if you have honeycomb and the cells are fully formed, full depth, that's a drawn out honeycomb. Sometimes there's just the foundation. So that would be the sheet that they build their comb off of. And it doesn't have any comb yet, so that's just foundation. And then there's foundation less, which is a frame that has no comb or foundation in it whatsoever. So we're talking about a 10 frame box with no drawn comb, just waxed foundation. So the foundation is what they draw their comb out from. I check them nine days after and eight frames are fully drawn with nectar and pollen. So now that they're fully drawn, that means the cells are constructed and they're complete and ready for baby bees, nectar storage, and pollen stores. I see no evidence of the queen. I'm planning on waiting until day 14 to decide if they have a queen. What are your thoughts? By the way, I'm in mid-Michigan and the nectar is flowing. Well, there's a lot of things going on. How can we find out if there's a queen present? Looking for eggs which is what Nate's doing here. If we don't see eggs, it doesn't mean you don't have a queen, especially being that a swarm was caught. And this is recent. So if we're talking about July, if you're catching a swarm in July, that may not be the prime swarm, the first swarm of the season from that colony of bees. It could be an after swarm, right? So then sometimes when they make multiple queen cells and the bees are departing, those queens will hatch out and then you'll find out well this colony swarmed and then two three days later you see the same colony swarm again and there's another cluster on a tree nearby and people hive that swarm of bees so then let's think about bee biology one of those queens hatched and she already swarmed within days of hatching so is she mature no she's not she has to mature for several days, up to nine days before she's even capable of doing a mating flight. So if she departs with a swarm, you have an unmated queen in the center of that cluster of bees. So then when you hide that swarm and you don't see any eggs, it's been a week or whatever. A queen, a new one, can take up to two weeks just to get her mating flight in, mate with the drones, which are not from her colony. She has to fly around and find a drone congregation area mate with a drone and then make a successful flight back and get inside that uh, colony and start laying her eggs. So this could still be a virgin queen in there. Or just recently mated and she hasn't started laying. So I would say be patient because there are other things going on here. One, they're drawing out comb. Bees that are queen right, which means they have a queen present. Uh, they have her pheromone. That binds them there. And guess what that inspires them to do? It inspires them to make new honeycomb. It also inspires the foraging bees to bring in pollen. And when they bring in pollen and they're storing it, I have a nest of paper wasps up there that seem to be upset all of a sudden. I keep paper wasps as a way to push out yellow jackets uh, from the apiary because the paper wasps don't bother my bees. Anyway. There is a nest of them living inside this building and they're just above my head and they normally don't pay any attention to me. They just have to be making some noise. Anyway, so we've got comb being constructed. They're bringing in resources. They're storing nectar. They're doing everything else that they would do if a queen were present. In the absence of a queen completely, so not just a laying queen, you know, no queen at all, they tend to not do too much investment in the infrastructure of the hive. They don't usually build comb because what's their inspiration for building new comb? One, it has to be warm enough to do it. We have the heat right now, so that's plenty warm. Uh, they also need to be bringing in nectar because that's the resource that they use to build the honeycomb. And the other thing is they need to be inspired to expand, create more cells so that more bees can be laid and then resources for those bees in the brood can be um, provided for. So they're acting like they have a queen. 
and I'm hoping that Nate gets back to us and lets us know what happens. But those are my thoughts, and he's waiting 14 days uh, to decide if they have a queen. So I suspect Nate will look in on them and find that there was a queen present, she just wasn't laying, and that when she starts laying, he'll see those eggs. If you see eggs, that queen has been in there within the past three days. So I think it's looking actually good for that. Now, how long should Nate wait? Let's say 14 days now and still no eggs of any kind. And they've stopped producing comb, let's say, and they're not bringing a pile of resources in. The mating that she did may not have been successful. The queen may have remained a virgin. She also may not have made it back at all. Now she's queenless. So within three weeks of hiving the swarm, three weeks, to me, that's the deadline. So at 21 days out, uh, you need to verify that the queen is active, that she's laying. In fact, let's backpedal that a little bit. 21 is the absolute limit. So let's go 17 days. So he's going to look at 14. If by 17 days there's no queen, you still have time to order in a queen to provide so that, that can, she can start laying and get going. What happens after three weeks? Every female worker in that colony has the ability to lay eggs. That ability requires them to modify, to wake up and activate their reproductive system. So these queen, these queens, these female workers will be able to lay drone eggs, which are considered infertile eggs. They activate their ovaries after they have been queenless for about three weeks. So then you get a laying worker. Now we have another pickle. So Nate's targeting the right time frame here. Uh, 14, 14 to 17 days would be safe to find out if no eggs by then. Order in a queen and uh, get them back on track. But it sounds like, based on their activity, that they have a queen. She's just not laying for one reason or another. Also, sometimes during dearth periods, queens can back off. They can stop laying when there aren't enough resources coming in. But it sounds like there are because combs being produced, nectar's being stored, pollen's being stored. All indicators of a queen right colony we're just missing eggs and he hasn't actually spotted the queen which also if it's a virgin queen guess what they're little they're skinny and they're hard to spot really hard to spot once they're fertile and they've done that mating flight their abdomen extends they're full of eggs and then they're capable of laying which also makes them more conspicuous on the brood frames next one is from Wendake I'm sorry I'm messing up that name Wendake any that's lots of bees. What are the main reasons of using a medium super instead of a deep one? Is it only to reduce weight and height for manipulations? Thanks. Okay, well, when we're putting together our beehives, we have choices, and this is the Langstroth hive design, which is the most common beehive design in the world today, basically. So if you're managing bees, you have three different box depths. You have a deep box, which is pretty standard. This, for example, would be a deep frame and it's foundationless. So this is what the boxes are based on. And it either holds 10 of these or eight of these. So it's a 10 frame deep or an eight frame deep. And in comparison, this is a medium frame. So see the depth difference. So what happens is normally for me, I use the full depth boxes, the deep frames, uh, for brood and for rearing. These are all deep frames throughout this observation hive. So that's because it's efficient for the bees. They get a nice big brood pattern on a single comb and they can attend to those bees better where if they have to bridge it to the next frame, then you know there's some inefficiency, they still do it. But uh, the main reason that people like me put on medium supers above the deep box is because first of all, it lets me expand my colony in increments. So smaller increments, the medium super, I mean, they fill their deep box. They look like they could handle a medium. I put that on, I wait for them to fill that. And then above the medium is where I put the honey supers that I'm going to harvest honey from, if at all. So that's also where the flow super goes and things like that. So I have a minimum of two boxes, but I would say the biggest deciding factor in what size box people put above the brood box would be their physical ability to lift the box. So that leads me to a discussion about the weight of your beehive. 
Now I know, for example, yesterday we took off honey from a seven frame Flow Super. Each of those frames yields just over half a gallon of honey. We know that a gallon of honey weighs 12 pounds. So I estimated that each frame is about seven pounds. So a full depth Flow Super with seven frames that matches the 10 frame Langstroth under boxes, that would weigh 49 pounds. So if you have no problems lifting 49 pounds, and remember the posture you're in when you're gonna be lifting the frames, lifting the boxes with full supers, you're leaning forward, you're reaching out, and it is a lot of stress on your back. So a lot of people wanna avoid lower back stress and lower back pain. Let's face it, a lot of people get into beekeeping when they're retired and they have the time to do it. So a lot of people are elderly or their hands aren't as strong as they used to be or you just physically don't want to deal with that kind of weight. So the next one is, let's talk about medium supers. So if you had this depth of frame in a 10 frame box and it all ended up, the heaviest, the heaviest material that's going to be in there would be honey. So let's say every one of these frames was full of honey. So you get up to three to four gallons of honey in a medium super. So now we're talking about a 36, 36 and up but you could be dealing with 36 pounds to 47 pounds to 50 pounds, depending on how much they fill the space with that honey. So again, a medium super even, 36 to 40 pounds. It's broad because they often bring in more or less depending on the bees, how deep they run their frames and cells and things like that. And the next one would be, let's see, shallow super, you end up with a 24 pound box and up but that's easy to manage. I don't know too many people that use shallow supers though. I take the shallow super and I use it as a feeding shim. So we can frame that up and then put your feeder on top of your hive inside a shallow super frame. That's what I use those for. I never run the frames in them because the most commonly available frames will be the mediums and the deeps. So if we're talking about being able to find the frames you want, getting the foundation that you want, acorn, frameless, you know, hexacomb, better comb, whatever you want to do, they're going to come in medium and deep. It's very rare to find the shallow super frames. So the mediums, you know, you're talking 36 pounds, a deep frame you're talking. Now, even though I said that my flow super is about 49 pounds when they're full, uh, deep frames run five to six gallons, and that could be 60 pounds and up. So if you've got another deep box, so there's another consideration. You don't want to lift 60 pounds. So now we can take two of those frames away and we can eliminate 10 pounds off the weight by going to eight frame boxes. Now, what about in the winter time? What about places where it gets really, really cold? I have both eight frame and 10 frame boxes. And in the winter time, guess what? They seem to make it through winter equally. So the eight frame or 10 frame, what really matters is the vertical space that they have to move up into when they're consuming their honey. But anyway, manipulations, the other thing is interchangeable. So I like if I like to have a deep base for every single one of my hives. They, have a, they start off with a deep. Some people just use medium supers throughout their apiary. Why? Because it's 100% interchangeable. If you have a deep box and everything else is a medium, your deep box is pretty much going to stay on the bottom and that's going to be your brood and stuff. And then the other medium supers up above are for your honey. But some people like to rotate those boxes. So they might use two deeps at the bottom. So now we have two deep boxes because they want a large brood area. And then in the spring, when the brood is up high, they rotate these boxes. They pull out that bottom box, they drop everything down and then they put those empty frames, empty cells, on top and now your brood is down at the bottom and then they kick off their next year so that allows the rotation of your bottom brood boxes if they're the same size so that's it but primarily i think the consideration is physical weight and uh, the ability for me to expand in smaller increments i don't want to just keep putting on deep boxes i could physically lift them if i wanted to i'm not interested in doing that so I just add them as they go. And uh, part of what I was showing yesterday, the day before yesterday, I did a live stream where I was gonna go out and uh, activate my flow frames, my flow super 
in uh, 93, 94 degree heat, which means if it's 93, 94 in the sun is actually much hotter than that. And I did a live stream and I was all set up and ready to take everything out of the back of that flow super. And to get around the front, because it's not on an actual flow hive, there's a box down there. And uh, flow hives have to be tilted back when you drain out their frames. So I was going to put a shim underneath the face of it, lift it up, and it couldn't because so many of the foragers were collected outside and they formed a bee beard. Solid bees where I would have put my shim and lifted the hive front to tilt it back. Couldn't do it. And uh, so part of the thing is flow hives have to be tilted back during honey extraction because that lets you drain the frames with gravity and uh, it just makes it much more efficient to draw it off. We need generally a two degree tilt back. So the question is, could we tilt it back and just leave it in that position all the time? It says right here, year round. And by the way, the person that posted this question, get this for a screen name, Zombie Feathers. I haven't seen feathered zombies yet, but I think that's interesting. Will the hive be unstable? It's not about being unstable, it's about what happens inside the hive. So we know in the winter time, now this is a slatted rack, but let's say that this is a landing board Let's say this is perfectly level, right? And part of the landing board, of course, extends out in front of the hive body, and that's because it creates a landing board, a landing zone for your bees. Now we generally tip it towards the landing board because in the summer we get lots of rain and stuff like that, and we want the water to run down and shed off and not go inside the hive and contribute to high humidity inside the hive and make the bees deal with water. So during a honey extraction, this is the back of the hive. We tilt that back. And there's the two degrees or whatever. And uh, then we drain off the honey and then we're done. And then we restore it to its level or slightly forward tip position. If we left it tilted back all year round, I actually got this question from uh, one of the flow hive representatives. Why don't I leave my flow hives tilted back in the winter time? And the flow hive too has a tray inside the bottom that collects moisture and debris. So the other thing is in the winter time, we don't want snow collecting on the front, melting and going into the hive. Now, even if there's a tray underneath, which is the reservoir to collect things, it would prevent moisture from collecting inside on a flat solid bottom board, for example, and uh, it drains down into the tray. But for me, that's a problem too. So if it's tilted back and if it can fill that tray with moisture, and uh, solid bottom boards, if they fill the tray with moisture, or solid boards hold moisture and don't shed it, now we have a high humidity problem inside the hive and they're not getting rid of it. And you also have the potential to freeze. So those plastic trays down in the flow hive twos, if that collects a lot of water in the dead of winter and it freezes, you just cracked out your tray, it's ruined forever. Ask me how I know. Anyway, so instead, you always want to tilt it forward for winter time, we want to shed everything. Solid bottom. Now, if you have a screen bottom board, it won't matter because screen, everything goes through. If you have the removable core flute or whatever you slide in, your removable trays underneath, uh, water and stuff just runs off of those anyway. But until the freeze thaws, you're going to be accumulating moisture and the moisture up where the bee cluster is will be controlled by the bees. They can warm that area, but once it hits that transitional point where the cold interface hits that warm interface and it hits that dew point, now we have water, now we have condensation, and then it goes down in the tray, which is not controlled by the bees, and it freezes. So, very basic reasons why I don't leave them tilted back year round. But if you have a screen bottom board or you're in an area where you don't get a hard freeze, you can leave it tilted back all the time because the water has a place to escape. If you have a solid bottom board, tilt them forward towards the landing board because a solid bottom board doesn't let the water go through. Here's from CB. Hopefully harvesting works out tomorrow. And that's again because it couldn't harvest from the flow super because the bees bearded. Fred, do you have any thoughts of pros and cons of resource nukes versus full-fledged hives? Okay, anytime someone says nuke, we have a nuke, I got a nuke, I got a five-frame nuke, I got a three-frame nuke, that's short for nucleus. Nucleus means it's a complete colony of bees, it's just tiny. 
So if you have a three frame nucleus colony or a five frame nucleus colony, they usually come in a nucleus box. And that's why people say I have a bunch of nuke boxes. So generally beekeepers that are in the business of breeding and selling packaged bees or selling nucleus colonies of bees, you'll see row after row of these very narrow, tall boxes and they're small. So the other thing is sometimes people keep, uh, and what's in a nuke, the queen bee, the workers, there's brood, there's eggs. It's a fully contained colony of bees. It's just on a small scale. So they occupy a small space because that's what they maintain. And uh, sometimes people keep nucleus colonies. I have them um, for no reason, apparently. I've got uh, these big boxes from Better Bee that will hold four different queens with their four nucleus colonies. And they're considered resource colonies. They're tiny. so. It's a normal, it would look like a normal 10 frame box, but it's divided in quarters and in each quarter and they have an entrance facing different directions. This thing is heavily insulated and it would be to get a tiny group of bees with a queen uh, capped off to the side and kept healthy and ready to go. So if all of a sudden you find out you lost this colony over here, you lost this queen, now we have a resource. We can collect one of those four colonies and we can go and we can install them in the box that's lacking the queen. So they're ready to go. We would avoid the situation that potentially is happening to one of the people that posted earlier on, which is I'm without a queen potentially. What am I gonna do? You might have to buy one in. They cost a lot of money. I buy bee weaver queens in when I order in queens and they ship them out right away. And uh, But that's $51 for a weaver survivor line varroa resistant hygienic queen shipped. I think they ship them UPS. No, priority, overnight mail. Anyway, uh, you save that money if you have a resource nucleus ready to go. I don't do it, do you know why? Because even though I only now have, we have 19 colonies now, which is too many. And uh, I forget about the small nucleus colonies. So what do they do? What does this colony back here do? This is much bigger than a nucleus colony, but it's not a full fledged hive. It's only eight deep frames. Look at the population in here. That's growing. What are they going to do? Well, when they get to maximum population and they run out of space for brood, there are thousands of bees in there just waiting to hatch out right now. Uh, they're going to swarm out. They're going to leave because the space they're occupying is too small. And these observation hives, as cool as they are, they're just swarm generators and they build up their numbers the queen starts getting chased around. They start building replacement cells. There are no queen cells in here right now, which is kind of impressive to me. Uh, and they fly out and then they start over again. That's what happens to my nucleus resource hives too. Uh, I forget about them. They get too healthy. They produce too many and off they go. So that's why I don't use them. If I had a huge apiary, if I were running hundreds of colonies, I would hire somebody just to keep small scale nucleus colonies of bees alive and ready to go just so I can continue my production. But we're backyard beekeepers. I have them. I don't use them for that reason. I'm a terrible beekeeper when it comes to keeping up with uh, tiny colonies and hoping to expand them just in time. You always end up having to expand them to an eight frame or a 10 frame box anyway. Now we have another colony in the apiary. My target, my sweet spot for keeping bees is 10 colonies. I'm a total failure. We have 19 now, and that includes one that I'm keeping several miles away to the north now. So we'll move on. N. Tatic or Tatic. I live in Virginia. And here's the dearth. I think this year is done with honey here. Which state is there, meaning here, and which uh, incoming nectar are you talking about? Now, let me just tell you what's going on this year. Normally, I get one meaningful honey harvest nectar flow season, and that is usually at uh, mid-August through mid to late September. So that's our main nectar flow, and that's when everything happens. But for some reason this year, even with a weird, really cold spring that we had, uh, everything is just coming in and all of my colonies are booming and I've had to expand almost every single one. 
including why we're taking off honey yesterday because I'm at risk of having my colonies be honey bound. What does it mean to be honey bound? Well, for those of you who just want to keep a small colony and you only want to have a couple of boxes, because let's face it, when you buy a kit, when you get a Langstroth hive kit, you usually get a deep box and a couple of medium supers, and uh, that's all you have. And once those are full, now what do you do? So if there's a nectar flow on and your population of bees is high and they have uh, really expanded and the foraging is going on great, this is why we have all the bearding, by the way, because there's a lot of nectar inside being evaporated down, being turned into honey, and uh, the bees are on the outside because they have nothing to do because they have nowhere to put the stuff. And also it's too hot and stuffy inside the hive and they need to get out of the way so your bees can ventilate and get it out. If you went outside of this colony right now and stood in front of the entrance, which is an inch and a half diameter tube, it sounds like somebody's running a dryer vent. They're moving some serious air. And that's to dry things down and keep the temperature under control as well. So, uh, this year we just have an incredible nectar flow going on. So what is the source of it? That's the question. White clover is everywhere. White clover is in abundance. And I always do field trips, and I recommend that you do that too. Walk around. Walk around and listen and see what the bees are on. You could actually, I thought we had a swarm of bees. I was out looking at milkweed, which is another great resource that's going on right now. And uh, it sounded like a swarm of bees. And we went over, and it was what's called smooth sumac. It's kind of yellow looking. And there were so many bees on it. I had never considered that a significant resource for the bees, yet they were all over it. The other thing that they're constantly on right now is milkweed. It almost doesn't matter which variety of milkweed you have. Milkweed produces an abundance of nectar. It's constantly producing it. So the same flowers can be visited over and over and over again. And that's, you know, the key thing to the milkweed is they want to keep attracting pollinators. And we know that they support, of course, the monarch butterflies. So I have lots of milkweed and they trap the legs of bees and hold them there to make sure that they get their pollen spread around, which is another strange thing that I'm doing a video on. So we have that. I also have spreading dogbane. Spreading dogbane looks like a really thin stemmed milkweed. And if you break it, it has the milk substance that comes out too. And it generates these tiny white flowers and I have a field of it because that stuff is invasive. That stuff has taken over my wildflower meadow. And I was thinking about maybe getting rid of it, but then I thought, well, let's wait and see how much the bees use it. And then next thing you know, of course, every you know third plant has two or three honeybees on it. So now that's a nectar source as well. The other thing that's just wrapping up are the linden trees. So linden trees have flowers starting in late May and into July. So they have kind of a broad flowering time frame too. They're a huge nectar source for the bees. And uh, that's pretty much it. So for me, these are the things that I've observed. So clover, milkweed, sumac, spreading dogbane, and the linen trees are basically done now. But uh, the white clover continues all through the summer. So it looks like we're not even gonna have a dearth this year. I mean, that's awesome. So, and then what's going to come in next, and they're just starting, you can see the heads on everything. So we have sunflowers coming up, hyssop is coming up, Maximilian sunflowers are going to finish out the year, and then of course, goldenrod, asters, we're not going to get a break. I mean, if I were in honey production and I were a commercial beekeeper, I would be dancing the happy dance because this is, every colony is producing an abundance of honey a huge surplus of honey. So, and these are colonies, by the way, the one that's in the video that's gonna go out in the coming week that uh, shows this honey harvest from the flow super there and the temperature readings and all the different hives, uh, they've never been fed. So other than emergency dry feed in winter, we put sugar on that colony. And uh, so these are colonies that have not been fed. They're finding everything they need from the environment. The only colonies I feed are the startup swarms that I collect and uh, if I brought in packaged bees, which we did this year, we brought in Saskatrass bees because I expected my bees to die off. So we fed them sugar syrup in the beginning. They don't need it now. Nobody right now needs sugar syrup. There's so much coming in. So when I realized in other parts of the country, because uh, N. Tadic or Tadic, I'm sorry about the pronunciation of that, is not the only person that said, hey, where is this nectar flow you're talking about? I, you know, I'm living 
pretty much in the same climate situation that you are and my bees are done. And it would be very unfortunate to say that your bees are done for the year. But uh, even in this heat, even with the lack of rain, we had a mild rainstorm pass through last night that amounted to nothing, 0.3 inches of rain. Anyway, the environment's yielding huge, huge nectar. Next one is from Arlie Jefferson. Can you tilt back just the flow hive box by putting some kind of shim between the boxes in the front? It would only be temporary, so I can't think of any problems, but I'm just a beginner. So here's the thing, and this goes back to, again, when I was walking around with my phone doing a live feed, thinking I was going to show the uh, honey coming out from the Flow Super. I did finish that honey extraction yesterday. The way I solved my problem is I went out there at 5.30 in the morning when it was nice and cool, and there's just a little teeny goatee, not a full beard of bees, just a little goatee of beards, and then I took a piece of wood and I just pushed them back and then got my bottle check under it. And I'm gonna show that in the video. I show the whole process. But I did a little sketch of what's being suggested here. I hope we can see this well. So, here's the hive stand. This is a standard deep box. Medium honey super full of honey. In fact, this misrepresents what's going on because I have two medium supers full, then the flow super. So what's being suggested is, why not just tip your flow super back, put a shim over here, and then drain it that way. Well, first of all, the bees are going to be coming going through here. We open them up to robbing. And uh, all I had to do was wait until morning, get my bottle jack placed, jack up the whole hive, and tilt it back, and not break any of those between box seals. Because the other thing is, one of the huge advantages of the flow hive, and we're going to talk about this later too because somebody else is asking questions. Um, the big advantage is we're not messing up the infrastructure of the hive. We're not pulling apart the frames. We're not pulling the boxes apart. And we're not smooshing the bees when we put them back together. And we're not pulling whole boxes and frames out. We're leaving everything intact. We're doing a gradual tilt. And guess what? The bees don't even know anything is going on. They don't care. I don't have to wear a bee suit when I do that. And you sit back there, you drain it off, the bees start to realize that there's nothing underneath those cell caps anymore, and they start to cut into them and clean them up while we're extracting the honey. So that satisfies the other thing where people are like, well, those bees don't even know that their honey's being taken away, and you're just robbing them. And then wintertime comes, and they go to uncap everything, they open that jar lid, and there's no honey in there because you took it. They know right away. Bees are clever. Bees are very smart. They know that even though when that thing shifts, when the cells do this and the honey starts draining out and there's a wax cap on the front that's undisturbed and the wax just drains out from behind it, bees walking over the surface of that know when there's honey in it or there isn't. And they cut a little hole in, they stick their tongue in, they realize there's no honey, they chew it open and they start cleaning out that cell right away. So it's much better to tip the whole hive back, drain your honey, and then use the bottle jack to slowly tip it forward and then it's back in its upright position. Nobody knows anything, no bumping, no change in landing board activity at all. But I appreciate those suggestions and I'm just sharing that it's unnecessary and it's much better to tilt the whole thing. Of course, the best thing is, because that's just a flow super and the reason I had the problem is because it's a Langstroth landing board that doesn't have a incline built into it where all of the flow hives have the incline already built in it's already ready for harvest and the flow hive twos have little adjustable feet which are my favorite hands down because you use those to level it you use those to tilt it and it takes a three-quarter inch wrench and you're good so that's my favorite way is the full flow hive system now next one is from daniel griffith so what are your options for helping a hive cool? Which is, this is because we have this big heat wave going on. I see a lot of questions in B Facebook groups I'm in. I see people ask if they should shade the hive or put a few pennies to lift the lid to aid ventilation or even opening the entrance wider to allow more bees to cool the hive. What do you think? Well, all of my beehives uh, do not have solid entrance reducers. They all have screens. 
The reason that I do that is because a rolled piece of aluminum screen, or this year we're using some copper screen just for fun, uh, we stuff them in the openings and air still flows through those. How do I know that the air still flows through those copper screens? Because I put in a little air velocitum anemometer and it was a hot wire anemometer, so it senses very slight movements of air. Fred, did you make a video of that? Yes, I did. So you take this little thing across and it's on a telescoping boom that sticks out and you move it across the front of the hive and it showed me exactly not only how much air is being moved through the screen, what the temperature is. So a very useful tool just to give you information. How does that inform what you're going to do? Well, for me, because I don't have upper vents in my hives, uh, none of them have them. They all vent through the bottom. Why do you do that? Well, because it's based on what I see the bees doing on their own when they're not cared for by people. And bees that are not cared for by people manage to get by somehow. And bee trees, we know bee trees are super insulated, super thick. So it's a different dynamic, but they only have one entrance. Guess what else? A friend of mine sent me pictures and video this week. Uh, her house is a very, very old house. A bunch of honeybees moved behind the clapboards of the house and they got someone to come and do a removal. Now this house looks like it might be from like the 1890s. And how much insulation was in those walls? None. So the bees moved into behind the clapboards. They got in and they're in the wall of the hive. And this hive, the comb in there, ran several feet. I think we realized that the comb ran 8 to 10 feet in length. And how many entrances were there? There was just one. How big was that entrance? It was like this. And all the bees, all the honey, everything that's in there, way up through there, it demonstrates that the bees have the ability to move air anywhere they need it from and out of a single entrance. Now, does that mean we should close everything up and only have a little tiny entrance? Uh, not really. I like the screen idea, but I like the idea of them venting through the bottom because bees can control their air very well. Now, when we're constantly moving things, like if we shim it up and we put a little vent in there, that makes sense to us. I mean, it's like if you had a three-story house and you go up to the top floor and you open up one of those windows all the way and you leave all the doors open and you get the Venturi effect. And so you have cool air coming in through the bottom and being drawn up through the house and out that upper window. And now we've got this nice cool draft going on and air movement, which cools the house, right? Well, the bees do all that on their own. Anytime we change their configuration, when we lift things, when we expand things, when we pull away the connective tissue that they have inside their hive, we are modifying it. They have already, if left to themselves, they've already built their comb, their burr comb, and everything else inside that hive. They have shaped it all. Look at this up here. They shape these little avenues and corridors and everything so that they can move air efficiently and move themselves efficiently through the hive. And I'm always fascinated when I see a rip out in particular because that was an uninsulated outer wall of that building. So they were handling the cold and everything else just being sheltered with whatever the thickness was of those clapboards. I was really amazed at how minimal the structure was. But uh, so bees control it very well on their own. So what do they need? They need water because they use water to cool the hive and water bees go in and do that and they paint their water all over the surface. What's the critical area of the hive? It's the brood. What temperature because I was taking the readings at the landing boards yesterday and all of the landing boards at that entrance, even though the surface of the front of that hive was uh, in the hundreds, like 105, 110, because the sun was directly hitting it. So the outside of the hive was hot. Let's not play games. They were cooking, right? So you might think, wow, they must really be in trouble inside the hive. So then, but we take our readings of the air temperature of what's coming out and they were almost all between 94 and 97 degrees. What temperature do bees need to work wax? Right around the 90s. So right, you know, same thing, 94, 95 degrees, 
that's a bee's favorite environment for working wax. So um, what should you do? You don't really have to open an upper vent. Now this is, if you're living somewhere where it's 113 in the shade, you might have to change the way you've configured your stuff. I'm talking about what applies to me, northeastern United States, it's unseasonably hot. We're in the 90s. Could you shade the hive? Absolutely, that helps. But if you're dropping, let's just, food for thought, let's just talk. Let's just, let's just have fun. If you're dropping the temperature to 85, 86, 87 degrees, which seems hot to us, this is what people do. We transfer our own feelings of comfort to the bees. If it's 85 or 87, guess what the bees are actually doing in there on their brood frames? They're warming them. So they're actually having to use their energy to increase the heat. Now, if it gets past those parameters, let's say inside the hive, it's getting up in the upper 90s, then the bees are going to have to move the air, they're going to have to bring in water, they're going to have to cool the colony, and they're going to have to protect their brood, which is what they do. Here's another thing I was thinking about. This is a hypothesis. This is nothing, but if you're looking for something to study, and you've got a tall colony of bees, getting the thermals of what's going on inside the hive, what, this is just a big what if. So we've already answered this question. Yes, shade them if you can. You know, in the 90s is actually fine for the bees. They control it very well. Uh, if it's way over that, shade them, do things to cool them down. Maybe you do need to open a top vent in those circumstances. If the bees are demonstrating they can't handle what's going on. But let's say they're handling it. Now, in that top cavity up here, even in this one, there's no venting up here at all. All the venting comes from down here. Do any of these bees look stressed right now? No, they don't. And the temperature in here right now is 89 degrees. So at 89 degrees in this space, these bees are not actively cooling the brood. Why? Because they actually need their brood to be a little bit warmer than that. So we're transferring too much on there. Now let's say, what if bees already know how to deal with Varroa? This is just, just guessing, you know. Let's say that in the upper part where the honey is, where they might let things get to 97, 98, 99, low hundreds, what if the bees that have little Varroa mites on them naturally go up to that highest cavity, to the hottest spot, and they stay there just long enough to overheat themselves just long enough to get that Varroa off of them. And then once that's done, they migrate back down to the cooler areas of their colony. What if bees are doing that? So I thought somebody was writing a paper about that. And I don't know what the parameters were, how well it was studied, but if it turns out that bees actually are capable of doing that when they have a high heat area within their hive, just an area, not the whole hive. I am not a fan of superheating the hive and controlling that yourself to try to kill Varroa. I'm just, I'm just not. But what if the bees are doing it on their own? So give the bees credit. They can actually control the climate very well given the resources that they need. Fresh water, a space they control, and you can vent a little bit, but remember, what are you losing when you're venting off the top two? You're losing that humidity in there, which is actually pretty valuable to the bees. Moving on, next question, Andrew Clayhold, I'm going to say. Hello again. Since you're in northern PA, when is a good time to do a fall mite treatment with oxalic acid? If you don't know, mites are, in this case, the Varroa mites, Varroa destructor mite, that uh, carries so many different pathogens and diseases that it's not just the mite itself. That thing is terrible for your bees. So we have two tracks of control for me, you know, one is to get bees that can handle the mites. That's what I do. That's why I support the bee weaver family in Texas. And that's why I buy in my queens from them. And I also work with local bees and we have the Saskatrass bees, which actually are showing an improvement in their mite numbers. And by improvement, I mean lower mite numbers during mite counts. So this timing of treating, I treat, if they show that they have a lot of mites on them, uh, with oxalic acid vaporization. All right, so 
when's the best time to do that? That stuff is not approved for treatment of your bees when you have honey supers on that you're going to use for consumption. It's not approved. Randy Oliver was on a podcast uh, a few weeks ago that I was listening to. And he said, you won't get the FDA to say anything about oxalic acid vaporization or oxalic acid residue because, to be honest, they just don't care. It's not on their radar. It's not a threat. What we don't have is formal approval to use oxalic acid treatment of your bees with Honey Supers on because nobody has medically cleared it. It hasn't been approved with Honey Supers on. I think it's a matter of funding. I think it's a matter of interest. First of all, you have to realize that oxalic acid residue would be a threat to people if they consume the honey. At what levels would it exist in the honey to be a problem for you? Now, I said uh, last year sometime that when I was looking up oxalic acid, which is considered a soft acid, and it's, it's in lots of plants, it's everywhere. So it's already in your hive, it's already in your honey, it's already in the wax, it already exists, it's part of the bees. What we're doing is delivering it through oxalic acid vaporization, which is a sublimation process. Yeah, put the granules in a pan that heats up and it goes straight from a solid form directly to a gas form, bypassing liquid. That's what sublimation is. So there are vents in there. I also did videos showing, because we use this observation hive, so I did the oxalic acid vapor treatment in this observation hive so we can see how the bees react to it, if they're stressed, if they're freaking out, and they weren't. Uh, the initial puff came in and they moved away from it, and then while it circulated through this hive, they went back to their normal routine while they were closed up and while the oxalic vapor was doing its job. So the bees, that impressed me. I had not seen that before, so I shared that. So it's all about timing, but we're going to go with the rule of regulation right now and say that you can't do it with your honey supers on. So what happens? In the end of the season, you're going to draw off the honey that you're going to harvest this year. I recommend that the very minute you're done drawing off your honey, if you have done Varroa Destructor Counts, Sugar Shake works for me. By the way, I tried out that bee scanning app on uh, my son's apiary. His bees, every time it came up, it said, emergency, uh, hive is in critical, might load, 10%, you know, so, and then we looked at those pictures, every picture we took of his frames, and they were low performing bees. Every, you take four pictures on each frame on each side, and then you submit them, and this app does analysis and shows the mites on them where they exist. And uh, a couple of times it did pick a bee's eye as a mite, but for the most part, it's pretty good. So that dictated that we needed to treat his bees because they're in decline already, they're under mite stress load, and of course, the viruses that come with that, which may last beyond the physical presence of the mite itself. So, as soon as your honey supers are off, do a mite count. If you use that app, people ask me about the app. Does that work? Is that good? But here's my thought on it. If you're getting a 10% mite load on that thing and it's just seeing the visible mites on the bees and you're shooting the brood frames, uh, yeah, it's time to treat. Absolutely, time to treat yesterday. We treated his bees and he had a rebound in his bees, just the behavior on the landing board and everything else within days of the treatment. So, and we're going to do three cycles of that. We do it seven days apart. So, treat on a Monday, the following Monday, and the Monday after that. The whole purpose is that eventually you're going to get a treatment in there where all the brood was exposed because the mites were reproducing in the capped brood. So if these were mites, you know what I really need to do is take that app and just photograph my observation hive and see if there's a mite load. It would be a great way to demonstrate the app. But uh, this is where your mites would exist because they reproduce the most here. They also love to reproduce in drone cells. So anyway, good time to treat in fall. As soon as you get those honey supers off, because we want your bees to be as healthy as possible going into fall, because what are they going to be doing then? They're going to be producing their fat bees, fat bodied winter bees. So we have to get this going ahead of time so that the foragers are still strong, so that the colony health is good, so they're able to bring in quality nutrition, because we want those fat bodied bees to be the healthiest that they can be 
to get your bees through winter. They're the ones that are going to live for several months. Remember, they don't forage or do anything else. Once they hatch out, they're resident bees. Their job is to preserve your brood nest over here. So the older bees in the colony, when they do that clustering up, they form what's called the crust, which is the old bees on the outside and stuff because they're going to expire first. And the last survivors in your colony to get you into spring to get those baby bees fed and taken care of will be those fat-bodied winter bees. That's why for Andrew here, I say the minute that you finish your last nectar draw off for the year, do your mite counts and treat and if you use that bee scanner app and it shows that you've got a major mite load treat don't even bother doing see here's because here's the thing uh, don't bother with sugar shakes alcohol washes and things like that if that app shows your popular because it counts bees too for you it counts them for you so you shoot your most populated frames and if it's finding mites your mite load is high don't even bother with the others because they're only going to show a higher count. The risk of the app is that you miss them. Like if it says, oh, you're clear, you got the healthiest bees on earth. I don't buy that. I wouldn't accept that because there could be mites that didn't show up to the, to the camera lens. And you use your phone. It's pretty cool. So anyway, that's what I would, uh, I would treat them. I would use that app first because it's immediate while you're standing right there. Let you know. If it's clear, do a follow-up check. If it shows a high mite load, treat. That's my opinion. Next one is from, from Fulao. How are the robbed comb combined colony doing? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we had uh, a colony of bees that got robbed out. I did a video of it, and we showed how to put in the robbing screen, how to stop the robbing. And then, of course, we combined a weak colony on a strong colony. They're both queenless. We put the newsprint in between those colonies. The first thing I'd like to say is the newsprint, when I slice it so that they could get going and removing it so the colonies could combine, they ignored the paper. They went through the slits and they all just combined into one deep box. So instead of chewing the paper out and getting rid of it like they were supposed to, they just migrated through the slits, joined up. They're all best pals. I ordered in a queen from Bee Weaver. She's in there. She was accepted right away. No great surprise. We thought we had a laying worker in the first colony, but we sprayed them with 50-50 sugar water and three teaspoons per quart of Honey Bee Healthy to, as part of the introduction. They accepted her right away. She went in there right away. She's laying right away. So they're actually doing well, and we have to do, of course, a follow-up video of that. I suspect that once they build up their numbers, because she hasn't been in there very long, once they build up their numbers, they'll finish removing the newsprint in there. And of course, during an inspection, if there's any left, I'll just pull that out too. They're actually doing well. They're flying, they're bringing in resources. And why not? We have an abundant environment this year. So that's fantastic. Here we go to the next one. Stephen Mack from Las Vegas, Nevada. Got cross combing. I followed your recommendation for better be comb. Worst mistake I made. Now, Las Vegas, for as you don't know, it's our desert southwest region. It gets very hot. It's not good in warm weather. It has all collapsed from the weight of honey in it. Out of four frames, only one remains. So, and I have only left it in there because it had some brood in it. With warm weather, the plastic foundation is really the only way to go. Or the empty frames, assuming the bees can draw straight comb. I had enough issues with the cross combing and I went through two queens before they ended up making their own. So I have been through every issue, worst case. By the way, not blaming you. How would you know that our heat in Vegas and better be comb do not work? But I think you should let your viewers know. I finally got a lane queen and then it all happened. What a mess. Okay, well, we have always talked about better comb is a synthetic comb that is pre-drawn and it is very soft. It acts and looks in every way like regular beeswax. And in my very first evaluations of it, I told people that you need to be careful if you're in a hot climate. 
Uh, Dan Skis Bees, I've mentioned Dan several times in several videos and asked people to check him out because he's in Texas and he's dealing with a hot climate and he had problems with the better comb sagging from the heat. So it has that potential. But one of the things that I also did yesterday, because since we had temps in the mid 90s and it's been consistently in the 90s, it's going to be there again today, uh, I went out and uh, I had to expand a colony. Uh, because they were bearding on the front, there were a lot of bees in there, and guess what's inside the colony? Better comb. So I thought this is a fantastic opportunity to look at the comb to see if it's having a problem with this high heat. Now as I described earlier, uh, bees control the climate inside their hive very well, assuming the population of bees is adequate for the space. If you don't have enough bees, they can't control the climate. So the box may be too large initially. But if you're using better comb, uh, there are some things that you can do. This is one of their frames, by the way. It says better comb right on the front here. But anyway, uh, when you get the initial deep box of comb, if you get their frames with them, they came with toothpicks and you push toothpicks in and stuff like that. And those are still okay, especially if you're in the north. Toothpicks will hold it in place because then the bees come along and they reinforce it. But also what better comb better bee makes and this is also hexacell it's no different better comb is hexacell and hexacell is better comb so i put it in wired frames now because i like it it's quicker first of all than putting in the toothpicks you run electricity through it you use these wide contacts here two, 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 two. electricity runs through it they heat up the comb settles into it and then there's no sagging so all of the frames that i pulled out in the high heat conditions that we have. And I also have in my horizontal long Langstroth box, uh, we have foundationless, which is nothing but the frames, and the rest are all better comb. They're going through this heat right now as well. So in hot climates, two things. One, I highly recommend you get wire reinforcement or you make your own frames with wire reinforcement and then put your comb on there. Gives it some structure, prevent sagging while the bees work it. The other thing is, you need to have a healthy, full colony of bees that control the climate in there. And I know that's kind of backwards because what I like to use it for, I hold back the better comb and use it when I'm installing a swarm or if I'm installing a package of bees because better comb provides ready cells for your bees to immediately start storing the resources in and to immediately start having the queen lay eggs in. So it gives them a huge boost. So I usually put three or four of these. I don't do the whole box full of them. And then outboard of that, I use the acorn heavy waxed frames because those are the ones that the bees draw at first. But if you are in a hot climate as Stephen is here, you do run the risk of your comb sagging especially if you've used the toothpick methods, their first batch that came out with the toothpicks running through them. And if you do use the toothpicks, they run in from the sides, toothpicks running through all the holes across the top, toothpicks run in through all the holes across the bottom too. And if that's a deep frame, there's the potential for a lot of flexing to happen through that field because it is very soft and softer when it's hot. So if all they did was put honey in there, that's heavy, that's a load. And check out Dansky's Bees. Also, he's done videos showing you what can happen to your comb. And I'm sorry I didn't uh, mention him more frequently, but we have in several videos talked about Dan and his problems with better comb in hot climates. So word to the wise for all of you that are watching now, if you're living in any of our four border states or if you're in a southern state where you get a pile of heat, Watch out for better combs, especially the deep frames. Put it on wire supported frames rather than just the toothpicks because you run the risk of going through those frustrating issues that uh, happened here where finally get a laying queen, finally get things going, everything's great, and most of the better comb turns into a blob inside the hive and messes everything up. So next one, Brad Oliphant, New York City, New York. 
Over 30 years ago, when I was young, I too was a beekeeper. I have three hives. I miss my bees. Not sure when, but within the next year, I would love to have a new beehive on a rooftop here in New York City. There are bees on the rooftops in Brooklyn. Anyway, do you sell those horizontal beehives? No. Do you prefer them over the other? They look great for me, not having to bend over all the time. Anyway, thank you for your videos. I'm learning a lot. Okay. I don't sell horizontal hives. I'm experimenting with my own. So the people that keep asking me, are there prints of your hive? It's a super basic design, but here's the thing. I'm not going to do any kind of basic technical drawings of that horizontal long Langstroth hive, which is what I'm doing, uh, until next year. I want to go through a year with it. That way, if there's any modifications that I felt it needed, if there were some failures, if there were some ways I could improve it, uh, I want to make sure and accomplish all of those before I put together any kind of drawing. And when I do, it's going to be on my website, fredsfinefowl.com. It's also freerangechickens.org. Now, you go to that website, that's where you're going to find the prints, and they're going to be free and available to everybody when they're done, and it's actually worked out for me. So do I prefer the horizontal high format? Let me tell you what, when it comes to convenience... I set mine up perfectly, like, so that if you were at your kitchen counter, you pop the lid, everything's right there. And I made mine extra long. It's 50 inches long. Uh, because now it has its own storage space built into it. Plus it has a platform. Like we have this cool table right here. It'd be like if you open up your hive right here and then you have all this table space with no bees on it to stage all your stuff, your, your feeders, your hive tools, your cameras, your equipment, your rack to hold up the frame so you can look at them. It's the most contained, convenient, easy thing for a beekeeper. I completely understand, especially if people are having problems lifting boxes and things. They want one or two hives and they want this convenience. There's no question. A horizontal hive is super convenient for people. Now, is it best for the bees? That's a big question. So that because people are always saying, you know, why don't you take flow supers, flow frames, and put them in your horizontal hive, then you get the best of both worlds. You can tilt those, you can take those out, and you can get your honey from that. I don't want to do that for a lot of reasons. One is I already have the vertical format. We have the Langstroth hive design, which is what the flow supers are made for. It's also the natural you know, instinct of the bees to move up through winter and to occupy an upper cavity that's not vented, that they control the heat in, and then they migrate back down as the season goes on. So these bees in here spend their winter in the top half of that. They do that in the wild too. So, but let's say the tree fell over and now the hollow log is this way and they're going to migrate laterally and everything. Well, thermal dynamics alone, the vertical hive configuration is the best and easiest for the bees to manage. Horizontal hives are the best and easiest for us to manage, but if you're looking to buy something that's horizontal and accessible and usable like that, do not use the horizontal Langstroth design. Use the Layens hive design. I don't have the Layens because everybody was asking about the Langstroth because it fits all these frames. It fits all the stuff that's designed for Langstroth hives. It's convenient. It's easy. It's easy to make. It's good to go. But if you want to buy one, Let's say you have some deep pockets. Horizontal, write this down, horizontalhive.com. That is Dr. Leo Cherishkin. He also published a book called Beekeeping with a Smile. It has a new edition out that's very cool, interesting. It covers their entire philosophy. So if you want to get that book and read it first, tell them I sent you and you'll pay the same as everybody else. Anyway, I did go to the website so I can answer this question for those of you who are wanting to buy a horizontal hive ready to go out of the box. He sells a bunch of Layens hive designs. Now the horizontal Langstroth hive has the standard deep box design and then there's just an inch below that. The Layens hive is much deeper. So now we have the best of both worlds. So you have the ability for your bees to utilize that vertical space in the winter time. So it's going to be good for winter, much better than the long lang, which you know, again, we're going to test it through winter for the first time this year. Uh, the other thing is, the reason I only use regular bee comb in that horizontal hive is because I want the bees to be able to shape it and cut through it and pass through it the way they want to. If I put plastic frames in there, if 
I put the flow super frames in there, if I put acorn frames in there, the bees can't shoot through the frames and modify it to their, you know, to their way of traveling through it and ventilating a horizontal space. Because again, I stuck with one entrance, one half inch high, six inch long entrance. That's it for the whole thing. They're doing great, by the way. Anyway, how much would it cost you to get the insulated lay inside with frames and everything in it? That's going to cost you $499 and it's in stock. You can also get a lay hive with frames that's all wood, not insulated, but thick wood, $399. Guess what? It's sold out. I checked it today. They're sold out until August. So if you're trying to keep bees and get set up this year and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, that is not going to be your move. But the ones that are in stock are the expensive ones, $499 assembled, ready to go. That thing comes in a box, ready to go. You just put it out there. How much does it cost for shipping? Thank you for asking. $9.99. $600 shipped. Guess how much I get for recommending this to you? Nothing. They don't even know who I am. So anyway, you can get a lay inside insulated with all the fixings. Vents, everything. $600 shipped to your door, North America, United States. So that's it. If you're going to get one, if you're going to buy one, get the lay inside. Now what, what happens when it comes time for honey extraction? Those frames are too deep. They're not going to fit a standard extractor. Right. That's true. Guess what else that company sells? A special extractor to handle those deep lands frames. They, they've thought of everything. Dr. Shereshkin, he's above average. Anyway, next one is David Lonely Star. Could you feed your bees a banana? Okay. I don't know what's going on. Uh, David here is like the fourth person in the last week that has said, Mr. Dunn, have you fed your bees bananas? Hey, do you feed your bees bananas? Bananas are super healthy. Do you feed those to your bees? Let me just stop the noise right there. Um, could you feed your bees bananas? You could. You stick a banana in your beehive. Is it good for the bees? No. It's not good for the bees. Here's what's going on. I don't know who's who's pushing the banana thing on the bees and people see it. Because we're backyard beekeepers. You know what happens? It's kind of like people that keep pets. You think something's... It's, it, you can't just leave the natural world as natural as you possibly can. Instead, uh, people get ideas about stuff that they boost your bees' health and do other things. But I'm going to try that. I'm going to try this. Please slow down. Um, bees, what are they designed to get their resources from? Flowers. They get their protein from flowers. They get their carbohydrates from flowers, from the nectar. The protein is in the form of the pollen. Uh, even people that live where bananas grow in the wild and who raise bees down there never see their bees going after the bananas. Why is that? I just want to say that if you put something inside your beehive, your bees are going to have to deal with it. So they could actually appear to be eating a banana when what they're really trying to do is get that stuff out of their hive. But wait, I saw my bees licking it. Yes, there's a sugar content to the banana. And they're going to lick the sugars uh, because that's what bees do. But the other thing is you've introduced a foreign object in the hive. Would there ever be a banana inside a beehive, naturally? No, there wouldn't. Lots of things like bananas, by the way. If you're going to stick bananas in your beehives, you're going to have raccoons and other things smelling that banana oil, and they're going to come looking for it. So, me personally, I mean, I'm kind of glad that David asked this question because it gives me a chance to address it just overall. I'm not a honeybee nutritionist, by the way. So, but I do know that uh, bees aren't designed to eat bananas. Uh, if you want to find out what bees like and you want to really give them the choice, when you put something inside a beehive, you took away all their choices. You stuck it in there. It's like the people that asked me, can I just put pollen inside my beehive? You can, but please don't. Much better if you offer it out away from your apiary and let the bees select and choose it on their own. Let the uh, 
the pollen substitutes and stuff too, I don't personally put that inside a hive. Let the bees find it and use it on their own. Uh, the best feed for bees is what they're naturally designed to get and bring in. There's another thing too, nutritionally, especially when we're talking about bees in winter, uh, some of the people were saying, I was told to feed my bees bananas in winter, that that's going to give them potassium and everything else. Uh, so what happens is they list all these things that sound so healthy and nutritious and, and good for you. But uh, when your bees are in the wintertime, remember in an area where the temperature is cold, and that's where I keep my bees, uh, they cannot fly out and eliminate. So just for example, food for thought, even honey, according to Cornell, the darkest honeys, so that would be like buckwheat and stuff like that. The darker the honey, the more mineral content and everything is in it. So the more action it has on the bee digestive system. And then the bees have to get rid of that. So when they're eating something like that and they can fly freely and the weather's warm and everything's good, who cares? They could probably even handle some material from decomposing bananas. I don't want that in my hive, but you, if you want to try it, you ever see a ruined banana? That's some slimy gunk. I wouldn't put that in my beehive, but let's say it's in there. There's ash in bananas. Look that up. Uh, bananas in winter should not be taking that on board. They should not because now you're going to have dysentery. Why do you have dysentery? Because I put bananas in my hive and it had stuff in it that my bees wouldn't eat, but I made them deal with it because I decided it was good for them. I put it in there and they licked it, so that settles it. Now, if you really want to know, and this is the way I do all my food tests, you know, resources for bees, whether it's the type of water they're using, the level of sugar that they want, if they're using a feeding stimulant like essential oils and everything else, I don't stick that inside the hive. The fact that they consume something that's in their hive already, to me, isn't very telling. What is telling is given the freedom to choose and putting resources like that out in the environment at a feeding station or something, See if they go for it. Now, if you get your bananas and you put them out there on a feeding station and you see a bunch of bees cutting apart that banana and hauling that home to their hive, then maybe you're onto something. But sticking a banana inside a hive, you just force them to deal with it. Bananas, uh, here's another thing I always tell people. Please link me to the scientific study that showed that bananas were an important resource for honeybee nutrition. Uh, because what you find out is, along with a lot of other claims about supplements and supplemental feeding of your bees, they're vacant when it comes to scientific published papers on that. And I think the reason is bananas don't get any traction. Uh, they don't get any traction in the academic community because uh, it just doesn't fit with bee biology and nutritional requirements. And again, the ash that I mentioned, and the idea that it's gonna give your bees dysentery in winter. And I mean, I can put a pickle inside a beehive and eventually they're gonna be cutting it apart and getting that pickle out of there. And that's because it's a foreign object, it's in the hive and they need to get rid of it. Bees will even take granulated sugar and toss it out of the hive if they don't want it. So if I left it out for them elective wise, and by the way, I just had a, just had a paper wasp fly down on me. I better get out of here. So I'm gonna have to see the instant replay on that. Did that, did it actually sting me? I don't know. You know, if you sit in a room with a bunch of paper wasps, eventually they might get upset at you. I don't know what's going on. So maybe they're not as friendly as I said they were. Anyway, the banana thing. If you have a study that's been done that shows feeding Bananas inside your beehive is a super benefit to the bees. I'm still open. I mean, a closed mind learns nothing. So if you want to shoot me that information, anecdotal information is not helpful to me. I think you're going to find out that just as many people that claim that bananas are good for their bees, uh, there will be just as many people who tried it, had a terrible experience, uh, put a banana in their hive and it just gushed all over everything and made a huge mess and dripped down between the frames and everything else. So. If you've got negative feedback, if you've tried it and you didn't like it, you can put that down in the comment section too. Anyway, moving on. Tony Fox. Bicester near Oxford, England. 
This is, you know, world community in beekeeping. I think it's the best ever. I've been monitoring my, monitoring my hive temperature and humidity. The temperature is a very steady 35-ish degrees centigrade. Humidity varies within a range of over 40% and under 50%. It is rarely over 50% and sometimes under 40%. It's summer here too, so I want to know if this is okay. I have closed the upper entrance and it has a solid top cover. I have placed a Varroa board under the mesh hive floor. This has put it up from 35%. It has also increased the egg laying per day. Okay, so the humidity percentage, here's the thing. It's one of the things that the bees actually do a very good job of controlling. So they control the humidity themselves. There are actually people, uh, there's Girl Next Door Beekeeping in San Diego. Hillary is her name. And she actually closes off her venting on really hot days. Why? Because San Diego, where she resides, is in the desert southwest. Humidity is extremely low, and the bees actually have a problem keeping their humidity up. So I think a 40-50% uh, humidity level is perfectly fine for the bees. And guess what? If they don't like it, they will alter it. Uh, they just won't bring moisture into the hive if they don't need it. And uh, they will add moisture if they do. So that's actually not bad. I think it's fine. The bottom venting is really good too. Next is from David Carricknan. Recently checked my hives and noticed that my original hive, one year old, and one of my new hives from a nucleus hive has cap queen cells. The new hive has two. I decided to leave them as they are as I do not really want more than three hives. But I would go to four if that is the best thing to do. I want to be a beekeeper, not just a bee haver, but I thought I would just let the bees do what they want, swarm or not. Is there something I should be doing? Thanks for your information. It's from Dave. Okay, so here's the thing. They've already capped their queen cells. That train has left the station. They are going to swarm. So uh, this, this comes into an area of kind of responsibility for beekeepers, I think. If you are where uh, it's okay for them to swarm, like where I live, thousands of acres of woodland nearby. I mean, the French Creek watershed is here. There's all this natural environment. So where I live, if the bees swarm, that's no big deal. But if you live maybe in suburbia or something, you have kind of a responsibility to try to keep the swarming down. And based on the description here, if you only want a couple of hives, then you need to be prepared to expand them through the year. The uh, other thing is uh, keep track of it because if they're already capped, there may actually have already been a swarm. We don't know for sure. But uh, depending on where you live, I mean, that's natural control. Bees left to themselves in a bee cavity, which by the way, is not a huge space generally. Uh, they will build up their numbers, they'll swarm out, and they'll create new queens, which is what's going on here. By the time they've capped, those queens are well on their way. And uh, because remember, queens hatch faster than any other capped brood in your hive. So... If a queen is capped, you know, she's, she's hatching within a week. So that means that she's going to come out and do her version of flights. Usually they've already flown out by the time that's happening. So you may have already lost them. So depending on where you live, that can be okay. The other thing is that's a natural break in the brood cycle, which means it's natural varroa control because the varroa depend on developing brood for them to reproduce. So you get a 21 day break because when the new queen hatches, she has to fly out. You've got multiple queen cells. So she's gonna have to wait until she's fertile, healthy, strong enough to fly. So give her up to nine days to do that. Then she has additional amount of time to go out and complete that uh, mating flight up to two weeks in general. Once she gets successfully mated with a pile of drones, usually they tell me it's up to 20. That again comes from Cornell. Um, once they do that and she comes back, let's say that was two weeks down the road, so we're 14 days without a laying queen in there. Now, when she does start laying, we're 21 days before new bees start hatching out. So look at the, the loss in numbers, which if you're just a backyard keeper and all you want to do is have a couple of hives and you don't want them to 
you know, overpopulate their colonies and stuff like that. You just had a really substantial break in egg production in that colony. So it helps keep the numbers down, keeps the varroa down, and still gives you bees to manage. You do have to pay attention because we want to make sure that she does make it out, that she does mate, and she does come back and start laying eggs. So after, you know, 21 days out, you should start seeing some egg laying. Uh, and remember the rule too, once the swarm has happened, once the new queen has hatched, mark your calendar because you want to make sure there's egg laying before that 21st day. Remember the risk of having laying workers there. Emily Walker. Thanks again for the great videos. I do have a quick question though. I know I'm a little late to the party. I installed a package from a local bee breeder into a flow hive two in the third week of May. They've built up very fast. I recently added a medium super. And with the recent 90 to 94 degree weather, I've seen some pretty substantial bearding on the front of the hive. Should I remove the pest management tray to allow more ventilation? Has also have noticed several hive beetles going into the hives, but lots of dead in the tray because the bees chase them out immediately. Note the beehive is on my back deck of my house. It gets heavy afternoon sun. I made a hive visor like yours, which is in front of the hive. Thank you. Okay, so here's the thing. First of all, the idea of removing the tray. Flow Hive 2s are extremely well designed and they're very well vented. They have a complete opening full width in the front. They have a vent in the back that you control, so that should be in the vented position. I also received this question from another friend who's keeping bees and I'm his mentor for beekeeping. Uh, wanted to know if you should pull the tray for the same reason, more venting. Here's what can happen. You pull that tray out of there and on a flow high tube, there's an aluminum insert that's vented and that's so the things can fall through as described here into the tray, like small hive beetles, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But if you pull that tray out of there and you get all that additional venting, guess what the bees are going to do that are bearding on the outside. They're going to migrate off of the front and they're going to go underneath and they're going to collect under there and they're going to beat under there. And guess what? Now you can't close your tray. So I highly recommend leaving the tray in place. Just keeping that entrance venting open. If you use entrance reducers, just use rolled screen or something like that and keep the back vent open. And I think you're still good to go because again, remember, the temperatures described here are not hugely uh, bad for the bees, 90 to 94. Remember, what's the temperature on the brood frame? 94 to 97. So they're actually in the zone of what they're designed to handle already. Now the problematic part here that I see is on the deck, so there's no grass and trees and things like that around or under it to help take away some of that heat. So a deck might be a hot spot. So you may want to consider some kind of shading. I do know the high visors as part of my thermal evaluation that I did that's coming out this week. Uh, to show the temperature differential and why the bees collect up under the hive visor because it provides shade and drops them 15 degrees from what the surface temperature is of the rest of the hive. So those are very good. Uh, so maybe consider some shade depending on what the deck's made of and how much heat really is out there. You should really know what the temperatures are that your bees are exposed to. But I expect if you would put some kind of thermometer at the entrance where the bees are venting, you'll find that the air coming out of there is right around 94 to 97 degrees consistently. The thing about the small hive beetles though I do want to mention, I'm fortunate I do not have a lot of small hive beetle problems here, but I'm going to mention this because these things are so cheap. Beetle jail. Beetle jails should be in your hive if you're somewhere where you're getting small hive beetle issues. And because I'm going to put links when I when I write down the things that we're covering in the subject matter in the video description, I also put links to stuff that might be helpful to you. So these beetle gel things are basically disposable. I think they're about 50 cents a piece. You get them in packs of 10 or six or whatever. And uh, you put your bait in the middle, close it up. You put your mineral oil in either of the reservoirs on either side there. You close it up. Your small high beetles try to get away from your bees and it's good that they're chasing them around. They go in here and then they get stuck in this reservoir. They can't get to the bait, so the bait's still good. And this hangs right over a frame. Just like that. Top in the back, where the bees go, where the beetles go to hide. The other thing is these trays from the Flow Hive Company, 
should have some uh, mineral oil or cooking oil or something like that in the reservoirs so that when something does fall through the tray, it doesn't get an opportunity to get away. Also, you're trapping them, so when you pull out your tray and inspect, you can see what kind of pests that your bees are dealing with. You also get to see varroa mites and things like that that fall through there. You do need to clean them kind of routinely because what you also get is a bunch of propolis, beeswax parts, a bunch of pollen that the bees that fell off their legs that they didn't get to install it. And uh, so those trays are really good. I want to address this. This is a Swiffer pad. Now there are a lot of different Swiffer dust pads and I know that people put these in their hives for small hive beetle control. I put these, because I thought I was a genius, I put these in, in the tray, uh, the flow hive tray underneath and the compartments were the perfect size for these. And I put one in each compartment. I figured beetles and things like that would fall in here. They get their little feet stuck and then they're trapped in there and then I can look at them and it kills them. They can't get away. People put the Swiffer smoother versions of this up in the top in the back and the beetles climb on them and get their feet caught and then they can't get out. But guess what else? It's kind of like the banana story. When you put Swiffer pieces and things like that, if your bees can get a hold of this stuff, they make it their job to tear it apart and they spend so much of their energy just getting this apart and getting it out of their hive. That's what they're doing with the Swiffer, um, the smooth ones too, even though the beetle beetles are getting trapped. Your bees are doing their best. It doesn't belong in their hive. It's not natural. It doesn't go there. And they're trying to get it out of there and they're tearing it apart. And so you just see all the effort. You'll find this stuff all chewed up. But I put mine down in the tray, unavailable for the bees. Uh, so they wouldn't have to deal with tearing it apart and trying to get it out of their hive. But uh, what was the result? The result was I got so much junk on it that it was ineffective for me to properly evaluate what had fallen in there. Mineral oil is my favorite. So that's it. Beetle jail. Swiffer, if you use them, keep them out of reach of your bees and let those beetles get trapped in them. That's all good for me. And next one is from Bell B. Bell. As someone with zero experience with beekeeping, but who eventually wants to get involved in the hobby, are there any downsides to using the flow hives to start rather than natural hive models? Would I be missing out on integral knowledge or practices? This comes up all the time. And so it's actually, I guess, a very good question. Uh, I have a whole playlist that's called my flow hive experience. You can click on the playlist and see everything about them. Uh, the other thing is there is no difference in beekeeping. I get these uh, messages and I try not to discredit anyone. You know, it's, I, I'm guessing that maybe the question is, is legit when I get these other questions from people. You're murdering bees in flow hives. Uh, bees need to learn to make plastic. They'll forget you put a flow hive in. They never know how to make comb anymore and you're creating stupid bees. So it goes from that end of it to, hey, is a flow hive better or worse or the same? They're the same. When it comes to managing bees, the honeybees that you keep are going to be the same honeybees. It's, the flow hive is based off of the Langstroth design. So whether the hive configuration, the way it's supported, the way the sand is, whether it's tilted one way or another, has zero bearing on your honeybee management practices. So, and the flow frames come in, the flow hives come in eight frame or 10 frame boxes. They match all the lengths throughout the equipment. Uh, the first box is, you know, foundationless frames, if that's what you want. You have uh, better comb, if you want to put that in there. You have hexacomb, you can use acorn frames. Uh, so the management practice is getting started. What's going on down here is all the same as any other Langstroth hive. Bee biology is unchanged. The only difference in a flow hive as compared to any other hive is going to be what happens when you have a super on it and it comes time to take the honey off. So instead of removing frames and putting them in an extractor after you uncap them and spinning it out and everything, uh, the flow hive, you extract the honey at the hive. Tilts back, you open the back, you make sure the frames are capped, that the honey is ready to go. You don't extract unripe honey. A lot of the other claim that people say is when, once somebody gets a flow hive, they take all the honey off, they don't leave anything for the bees because it's just too easy. 
Well, there are lots of new beekeepers who are so anxious to show people that their hives are productive that they pull out frames of honey even when they're only half capped. This has nothing to do with whether it's a flow hive or a traditional extraction method. It has to do with the person that's managing those bees and not understanding when they're ready to have a surplus that can be removed. There are a lot of new people that get excited, just want to take everything off, and the next thing you know, the weather turns cold, the winter comes, and your bees have no food. So that's not about flow hive people being greedy and traditional hive people being a wait and see type. There are greedy people for any type of hive configuration. So the only difference is how honey is removed. You still have a responsibility to maintain the bees, to inspect your bees in the brood box, to make sure your queen right, and then to make sure that they've stored up resources for the winter that they're going to face wherever it is that you live. If they haven't stored the resources yet, a deep brood box in the northern United States or any cold climate region, the deep box has to be established with brood resources for the bees. Brood, pollen, nectar. It's all in there. Next box is for their nectar honey stores. Period. Because you know that where you live, you may have a long winter and they're going to need that honey to get through winter. So now we have two boxes. The third box or the fourth box, even depending on where you live, is going to be the flow super, which is mechanized frames that you activate once they're full of honey and you drain off the honey from them. And guess what? If they never fill that frame again, that box again, they still have the medium box below and the deep super below that to get them through winter. It's your responsibility as a backyard beekeeper to not take off resources regardless of what hive configuration you have. Some people get a flow hive in the first year, you get nothing out of that flow super. That's because you're letting the bees get established and you're letting them build their resources to get them through winter. So that's it. That's the last question for today. Thank you for watching. If you have a question, write it in the comment section down below. And don't forget to click the like button over there to let yourself know that you've watched this episode so you don't do a repeat. And feel free to subscribe if you want to see everything that I put out about everything that I cover. And people are always asking how they can contribute to me. I highly recommend that you just go down here to the Teespring listings below because we even put out uh, honeybee related, you know, masks to wear because where I live, everybody has to wear a mask now. Anyway, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, that you're staying cool in the heat wave, and that you're getting all the rain that you need, and that your bees are healthy. Thanks for watching.